So as we begin to wrap up Unit 6, so looking at you know, a combination of imperialism, all those revolutions going back from the Industrial Revolution to the French Revolution, we wrap it all up now with the idea of imperialism and how that connects to the building of global empires, or in this case, more expanding of global empires, and for some, the beginning of building them which will also include things leading up to World War I with global conflict, as it will all kind of tie into kind of indirect, indirect causes of the Great War. Um, so this is tying in ideas back to nationalism, the Enlightenment period, um, industrialization and the Industrial Revolution, and tying it into continuing ideas of colonies and the rights and responsibilities of governments and those of their citizens and who they look after. So... <clears throat> We want to think about, you know, definition or defining both imperialism and colonialism. So we want to think about it, what is the difference between these two ideas? Because they're very similar and in some cases interchangeable, but there are some stark differences. So with imperialism, it's when a country dominates or influences the subject or foreign lands without directly controlling them to gain profit or advantage. So typically this means that you're not actually controlling everything that they are doing or actually, you know, forming what we'd consider to be settler colonies like the United States, Australia, New Zealand. Okay, and often done this is through military force, trade, business, or investment. So think things like, you know, imperialism control um, within China, within the Ottoman Empire, or the United States with the Philippines. Now, connecting this to the idea of colonialism, it's establishing a colony in foreign lands um, that is done in two ways to be part of an empire, which connects right directly right back to the idea of imperialism, but again, this time through direct control, uh, whether that is again through settler colonies, so sending people to occupy the land, or administrative control. Um, that can include an economy, politics, um, social and cultural political structures, um, through the use of force and standards, whether that's trade policies, education, cultural standards, um, so on and so forth. So again, um, examples of this would include India, um, as we will see in Africa, um, French Indochina, um, and what Spain used to have in the Americas. All right. So in the 19th century, in 19th and 20th century, this is what we see within Latin America um, because this differs now as it focuses, or sorry, um, differs as it is now because it controls more of Asia and Africa and economically still having that economic colonial hold um, on Latin America as we've kind of stated way, way back in, um, in chap chapters 28 and 30 when we looked at the fact that while Latin America was independent, they were subjugated and um you know, essentially hogtied back to Europe, in particular Great Britain, um, for economic advancement, technological innovations. So here we have on the left kind of the empires, societies, groupings um, that existed prior to Columbus's voyage. Um, so you can kind of see a number of the African city-states that were known at the time that we can kind of represent. Um, you have, you know, the Incas, you have the Aztecs, um, you know, the Yuan dynasties, the Mongol Khanates, um, well, this wouldn't be the Yuan dynasty, it'd be the Ming dynasty. Um, you know, tributary states, Japan, um, and, you know, all these other different groups that kind of exist, a little bit of the Ottoman Empire there as well in the green. Um, and then here we have, you know, 1700, where is it looking? So a little more established, a little more known, um, you know, city-states. You have the Spanish colonies, British colonies, French colonies, um, Portuguese here in Brazil, um, King dynasty up here, um, and, you know, a number of different empires, so the Mughals, Safavids, um, Ottomans again. And then by 1914, the map looks like this, where you can kind of see who is in control or at least occupying or determining the outcomes in certain areas. So um, at this point, again, almost all Latin America is free and independent. Um, Africa, though, is now com almost completely under control or at least subjugated to Europe, as is much of Asia, which it had not been, you know, 200 years prior. So we want to see, okay, what has happened, what has occurred within this, because last we left off, we knew that the Qing Dynasty um, in Japan were, you know, fighting off British um, intrusions, but what about the rest of, you know, Asia, and what about Africa? So that's where we're going to spend most of our time within this chapter. So we want to look at also the motivations for, just, for and also justifying imperialism and the tools that are also used for these purposes. All right, so in terms of motivation. So we have economic, political, and cultural ones. We also can fit in social here too. So the economic ones, very much tied into the Industrial Revolution. So as Europe again is expanding its industrial complexes and abilities, they need raw materials to produce all these products. In many cases, like for textiles, you need cotton. Um, for you know a lot of your factories, you need coal and other sources of power, so where are you gonna get that from, all right? But not only that, you also need markets to sell. So hence, if you also not only have colonies or add more colonies 
to give you natural resources um, to then you can bring back to your home country, produce it, and then sell it. It can also give you a marketplace for these places or a marketplace to sell these products. So um, though not much of it actually is sold in return back to um, you know, colonies within Africa and Asia, um, there is obviously a market for that and also limiting access to trade with other people. Um, another one, and this is kind of a fun tie-in, at least I think so, um, is the importance of guano, which is bird feces um, that in many cases they are able to scrape off of islands where there's a lot of it. And um, this is very much necessary throughout the Atlantic and through the Pacific um, in order to use that for fertilizer. I um, mean, the United States engages, this is kind of the first form of um, economic or I shouldn't say economic, but just imperialism um, in the United States is for guano. Um, so again, that's really important for the economic piece for agriculture because um, we haven't come up with uh, synthesizing fertilizers at this point or chemistry made ones. So um, for political purposes, um, so we have naval stations, so places where you can dock, refuel, um, protect you know, your colonial holdings, um, protect shipping. Um, and then it's also a matter of nationalistic pride too, because you can say, hey, we have these colonies. We were able to, add, we were able to conquer these people. and We can show um, our neighbors you know, how strong we are and that we can dominate these parts of the globe. Um, but it can also be used as a distraction from internal problems. So if we're talking about the Industrial Revolution and the workers' problems um, and not you know, having enough people to sell to, enough products to make, um, this can alleviate those purposes by giving them more products to create, more um, products to sell, and more markets to sell to. But also, uh, this is a movement for, hey, we have some more unemployed people, we can put them in the army for these expansionist policies, and also to distract from the internal problems and say, hey, look, we're really, really strong, look what we can do here. Um, so it really is, again, a could be a form of distraction on that then. For the cultural piece, it's the expansion of Christian and European values. So this comes in with the poem by Rudyard Kipling very, very well, the idea of it's the white man's burden or it's, our, it's the Europeans' job and also kind of America's job um, is the feeling to civilize the non-European Western world um, to bring political and social stability. So add in Christianity, add in um, Western-style education, because um, these are considered proper compared to backwards barbarian, you know, racist beliefs on the other people's tendencies. Um, so the idea of social Darwinism, so using um, the theory of evolution that we've advanced so far because, you know, we are the strongest, we are the ones most fit to survive. So hence, we should be using this as a reason for why we are better and to prove that to everyone else too. Um, so those are kind of the cultural motivations and justifications. All right. And also, it's, it's important to note here, um, as the book states here, that many missionaries will work actually against imperialist goals, so trying to, again, take advantage of people um, and use them as laborers and for their workforce. But in many cases, um, and, you know, missionaries will work as facilitators, but in some cases they do actually help the um, imperialistic mission for whatever country that they are from. Um, but not all of them are in favor of that. So they can kind of come together. Sometimes they don't work together. All right. So in terms of the tools of imperialism, what allows, you know, um, the British and others to kind of take advantage of this? So again, much of Europe. Well, part of it has to do with inoculation. So um, learning how to actually inoculate um, the Europeans against, you know, more tropical diseases such as malaria. Um, that had limited the desire and also the ability for Europeans to go into the interior places like Africa and India because, again, you know, if it's going to kill a lot of people, and it's going to cost a lot more time and effort, and it's not going to really be worth it, will be the point. But when you get these inoculations and vaccines, that allows them to obviously build up an immune system. Um, and that way, they can go into tropical interiors of these continents, of these locations, and be a larger sustaining force day in, day out, year in and year out. Hence why we have this little advertisement down here that says Q9. Um, kills malaria germs and you have to take a daily dose in order to suppress the uh, um, the malaria genes um, to essentially keep malaria away, keep you healthy. All right. Um, so that's one example. Okay. Others, transportation. So steamships, as we've said before, um, allowing us to go around the world at much faster rates. Um, and then also as I, you know, adding into warships too, with iron, ironclad warships, think the monitor and the Merrimack from U.S. history, obviously being additional powers that expand the ability to um, go into naval combat against lesser forces, um, but also the addition of railroads to go to um, certain parts of countries and be able to extract uh, those raw materials, get them on and ship them out faster. Um, obviously a very large part of that and also the ability to have better contact and to maintain said contact. Um, 
with those areas and be able to move troops around or assistance if needed. And then also the additional, uh, the additions of the Suez and the Panama canals. So kind of these blue lines here, and you can't really see it very well. Um, so the blue line is kind of the canal zone. Okay. And it really cuts down time, distance, um, and then everything associated with it. Because you don't have to spend as much on fuel. You don't have to spend as much on food um, for these travels. Cause now you don't have to go around in this case, you know, from, Trying to get from New York to LA, you don't have to go around South America. You can cut through the Panama Canal zone from, you know, in this case, you know, London to um, Colony of India. Instead of going all the way around Africa, you can go through the Mediterranean, cut through the Suez Canal, save time, money, effort, all of those things. Um, for military, so some of what we were just kind of mentioned there with the ironclad warships um, and obviously using the railroads for it too. Um, but there's also, again, the increased use of now. Um, repeating rifles, machine guns, um, more accurate, easy to move artillery pieces. So they're more light, more mobile and lighter. So it's not just cannons, but think about the artillery that'll be used in World War One. Um, so it's again, a little bit, it's not a little bit much more of a bigger advantage for Europeans um, because of those you know, successes. And then, you know, Japan and the United States obviously add in as well. So for communication pieces, so obviously you have faster modes of transportation but you also have faster modes of telecommunication with the addition of the telegraph and then putting submarine cables down um, to reduce communication time and the ability to prepare and respond to crises. Um, so because of the addition of the telegraph and these submarine cables, um, between London and Bombay in India by 1870, it took five hours to communicate back and forth instead of weeks, if not months, um, which again is very, very essential. Think about, you know, um, I always use the example in US history for why you know, the American colonies, one of the reasons why they became more independent was because, you know, you are three months away from Great Britain telling you any information. So like, or I should say six weeks away, but like if you're writing for help, it's going to take a minimum six weeks for it to get from across the Atlantic to London. Then we'll have to debate it another six weeks to get back across the Atlantic. So now we've reduced it down to about five hours between, you know, England and India. Okay. Obviously other parts of the globe, a little bit longer time. Um, and then oddly enough, and this is something I found out and I really, really love to share, um, during World War II, you know, when we get the telephone is starting to really pop up at this point, again, very beginnings of that, um, President Roosevelt, not through necessarily the telephone, but again, wireless and, te and telegraph response lines, was able to really receive any communication or communication from anywhere in the world, updates on the war effort um, and how things were going within about five to 10 seconds in the 1940s. That's pretty darn good, um, you know, as a form of, you know, pre-modern internet. Um, so that talks about the advancements in communications that are consistently being made, but allowing them to, again, consolidate their power. And then using of education uh, to push forward preferred culture on the inhabitants. So using culture to push language, push European values and ideals onto the people that they are, that are under their control. So, um, so yeah, that kind of covers the backgrounds of it. Um, and then also the motivations and the tools involved as well. So that is where we're going to um, end it for today. And then we will connect it back and start talking about actual implications of imperialism uh, within the next videos, particularly looking at India and Southeast Asia and Africa.